On behalf of OIST, it is absolutely my pleasure and honor to extend an absolutely warm welcome to all of you. For those of us, those of you who have traveled from far away, our keynote speakers, those of you who have traveled from other parts of Japan or Okinawa, and also our entire OIST community that is here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. This is our third annual symposium. Uh, of the Center for Professional Development and Inclusive Excellence, commonly known as CHUB. Here, it's easier to say. And our annual symposium brings together bold ideas and innovative thinkers to explore themes that enhance our ability to engender excellence through inclusion. Our 2024 theme, Inclusive Communication, explores the ways in which we can center equity and inclusion to break down barriers and in so doing, reveal new insights that lead to broader, deeper understandings. Inclusive communication holds all of us accountable for our assumptions and biases that exclude the voices and the contributions from certain groups. One might venture to say that communicating clearly and inclusively is a moral act. The great enemy of clear language and inclusivity is insincerity. And to be insincere is to be untrue. Inclusive communication creates paths toward clarity and exchange and sincere interaction. So what could it mean then to take an empathetic stance toward constructing meaning through our interactions. The late Nobel laureate and human rights activist, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, espoused the philosophy of Ubuntu, which describes an African value system of the interdependence of humans on one another. Ubuntu is translated as, I am because we are. We are human only through relationships. Archbishop Tutu said that a person is a person through other persons. Inclusive communication highlights our interdependence and allows us to consider the biases and actions that exclude meaningful participation and inhibit our collective well being. Our keynote speakers have been instrumental in breaking down barriers to fully participatory engagement. They'll raise our awareness of what critical voices, data, and representation are erased when information is biased or access to participation is limited. Their work will inspire us to take action in our own roles and our environments and institutions to enable all of us to embody an ethos of Ubuntu to work toward an inclusive, collaborative culture. And now, I'm pleased to introduce my colleagues Chiaki Chibana and Misato Matsuda, who will introduce our dance performance group to open our symposium. Chiaki. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to Okinawa for this symposium and to Oysters. Thank you for walking all the way to Love for. Today we would like to welcome you using Uchinaguchi the indigenous language of Okinawa. That's what Misato has been speaking. We are now standing on the land of Tancha. So we would like to welcome you through a traditional Okinawan dance rooted in Tancha called Tanchame. It literally means in front of Tancha. That's the beach. 
反対に、タンチャヌシマンチョウ、チュイナチュイナ、シグトゥヌアタティネンサビン。イウトイガ、ンジャイ。反対に、イウウイガ、ンジャイ、サビタンリ。Kathy mentioned how we build a community together. And they say, in タンチャ、everybody had a role to play. And the dance shows the life of Tancha community. And you see one person going fishing with a paddle, eku, with the paddle, and another person selling the fish in the basket, baki. Namakara, Shimabuku, Ryu, Chihiro Kainu, Katagata, Ga, Udui, Uduti, Kumisen, Ansani, Oisto, Watta, Oisto, Chinen, Amin, Uibindo. We are honored to have dancers from Shimabuku Ryu, Chihiro Kwai. We have Lina Shinshi, Lena Shinshi, and Ami Shinshi. Ami with the paddle egg, she actually works at OIST. Ami, Lena, Tanchame Unige Sabira. Ami, Lena, please dance the Tanchame for us. シェウニゲサビラ Oh, oh. 
はい。ダンチャメイヤイビータン、レナアミ、イペニヘイデビル。Thank you, Rena Ami. That was a tanchame, the dance rooted in this area. ドアンシェ、シューアチャフチカヌエダ、ウヌシンポジウムがアジクータシンポジウムナイルグトゥ、ワッタエニガトイビー。We hope this symposium will be an Ajikuta symposium for you. Ajikuta in Okinawan language means rich in flavor. So enjoy this Ajikuta symposium. Thank you. What a wonderful Ryokyo dance performance、uh, by incredible talented artists. And、uh, this is one of the best ways that we、uh, can think of to really welcome you here to the Okinawa Island, to OIST, and、uh, also to remind、uh, all our oysters that we are actually so,、uh, living in such a wonderful place with this,、uh, in front of this fantastic beach and the culture that. Is here and that also is part of our mission to support and,、uh, and make the most out of. So, so, in that way, I want to also um, uh, say good morning、uh, to everyone. And、uh, I am Karin Marquides,、uh, president of、uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology,、uh, called OIST, of course. And、uh, thank you for joining us、uh, at this event. And I feel、um, the, uh, want to、uh, also welcome all of you that have traveled from far away and uh, are ba- uh, the ones that are based at OIST. You are equally welcomed, of course, to this,、uh, this day. And uh, uh, we are especially pleased and thankful to have an outstanding list of keynote speakers here with us today. And it's a great, great honor、uh, to have、uh, with us、uh, the U.S.、Uh, Council General, Matthew Dalva, and uh, to uh, Dr. Natalie Konomi from Kyoshi University,、uh, Dr. Kana Grace from University of College London, and、uh, Professor Catherine Dignacio from MIT, and、uh, as well as、uh, Dr. Vic Savanathan and、uh, Dr. Laura Bonnet from the Harvard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was actually in、uh, December to 2021、uh, that OIST established this、uh, new Center for Professional Development in Inclusive、uh, Excellence, also called C Hub here at OIST. And、uh, in just two and a half years,、uh, Dr. Kathy Tamayama and her team have actually um, uh, uh, really d- done a wonderful、uh, wor- uh, work out of this、uh, C Hub、uh, activities and, and uh, build, uh, building a culture here at OIST. This,、uh, this annual C Hub Symposium is just one of the activities that C Hub's Valuable in C Hub's valuable portfolio, and it has become a signature event, you can say, for OIST.、Uh, so, many of you have also participated in the peer to peer mentoring circle that was、uh, established、uh, by C Hub.、Uh, and I'm sure that、uh, the ones of you that did participate in that will,、uh, will appreciate the focus today. To uh, dis- uh, dismantle uh, individual and societal biases and barriers and to uh, communication uh, through more empathy, understanding, and accountability. So,、uh, I'm looking forward to hear more about that after this symposium.、Uh, each year, the C Hub Symposium gives us、uh, an opportunity to explore in depth、uh, an, an important topic that can enhance our. Ability to really achieve excellence through inclusion. And in the past years, we have learned about inclusion, inclusive leadership and mentorship、uh, with the help of distinguished speakers and participants from Japan and around the world. And this year, we have another exciting and significant topic in focus in the in- inclusive communication. So, when I first heard about、uh, this topic, I thought that it、uh, would mean many different things for different people. So I'm, I'm also very much looking forward to hear from,、uh, hearing from the experts 
about their perspectives in this, in this uh, most uh, relevant topic. But one thing that I'm convinced about is that inclusive communication requires active and thoughtful participation from the, the members of community. Uh, I also know that inclusive communication is a ba uh, base for building trust. And it is by the actively uh, participation in discussions, exchanging views, asking questions, get insights, and giving feedback that we can ensure that the understanding of a message and, uh, uh, and the interest of everyone is considered. Uh, a leader has the responsibility to make sure that everyone has free access to participation. And it is also everyone's responsibility to listen, to observe and engage in the inclusive way that uh, will build the trust in the team. It is known that um, uh, a fraction of our, um, of our employees do not feel fully included at their workplace. Uh, it's true all over the, uh, the world, but even so here. So OIST is a young organization that has grown fast and attracting people of, the, of very diverse backgrounds. The development of a truly inclusive culture will be essential for OIST. Communication and visibility plays a central role in reaching an inclusive culture where all employees are valued and able to participate fully. In this culture, curiosity-driven research, transformative innovation, value-added collaboration, and equal opportunity to contribute will flourish. While clear pol um, policies are important, of course, it is the daily communication practice in the workplace that gives the important sense of belonging and respect. Right now, our priority is to develop a forward-looking strategy for OIST, where we can reach out, uh, our, where we can reach actually our mission goals and be a proud example of a university in this century where verified knowledge prevails. To all the members of the OIST community in the audience, I would like to say that OIST new strategy will give you many opportunities to participate in and shape the future of OIST. We began this process by uh, com uh, a commitment to our mission and uh, confidence that we know who we are and uh, our, who we are today and by the um, uh, way that we analyzed unsolved internal challenges through something we called strategic working groups. This resulted in defined projects that now uh, are, uh, will be the base for taking OIST to a more inclusive and mature university. Many of you have already engaged in, in preparing for the upcoming strategic process, and you shared your concerns with, men, uh, with me during my listening tour also across OIST, and participated in giving feedback to the strategic working groups. These are important baselines to establish before embarking on, on something new and, and uh, calibrate the dynamic range of our university in, in our mission areas. To breathe life in the strategy. A yearly process to include voices from each employee in an organized process and communication channels will be uh, activated very soon as we start the new fiscal year in April. More information on the strategic process will, um, with opportunities for your feedback is, um, is still uh, possible and it is coming up in March 18 in a strategic town hall event. I'm looking forward to a most inclusive dialogue there to steer OIST in the direction of our shared vision. vision. At OIST, we truly are incredibly, uh, we have an incredible community. The talent uh, each one brings to the organization is just remarkable. We have people with such a diverse range of backgrounds and uh, lived experiences. So in addition to thinking beyond the boundaries of traditional science, 
At OIST, we are also aiming to think beyond the boundaries of our perception. This symposium is an opportunity for us to learn how to practice inclusive communication by challenging our assumptions, our questioning our current knowledge, and fostering new insights. Together, we can relearn the tools and best practice in, in a partnership across different generations that will build the future. So inclusive in, in communication is a strategic advantage to attract talent and to make everyone feel valued. And of course, to make OIST to reach its mission goals. Its mission goals, where we are very here in the town, the Tancha Beach. So uh, thank you very much, and I wish you all a very uh, fruitful day, and uh, that you can take a lot of things with you from this, this uh, inclusive communication focused day. So now, now uh, friends, it is my pleasure to also here introduce the first keynote speaker for today. So Dr. Natalie Konomi is a Vice President for International Affairs and Diversity at Kyushu University. She has over 20 years of experience in academia. Her research spans organizational management, strategic alliances, and intercultural communication. She has dedicated her work to promoting cross-culture understanding and internationalization in Japanese universities and communities. Very important topics. <laughs> Indeed. Um, her global efforts have been recognized through the several awards, including the Hokkaido um, Social Contribution Award for connecting uh, Katami City in Japan to uh, Ulaanbaatar <laughs> City in uh, Mongolia. She has extensive experience in navigating different teaching environments and uh, 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 customizing classes for diverse uh, cohorts of international and Japanese students. So, please help me to welcome Dr. Natalie Konomi. So, President Marquitas and Kathy, thank you so much for inviting us to this great symposium. Um, it's the most important topic ever, I believe, inclusive communication. And I will focus today a little bit more on the cultural and language part. Um, so, I don't know if you see the slide, yes. So, it, the topic is building bridges through inclusive communication. And um, I just really want to share my insights, from my experiences. It's going to be very basic. Right? So you're going to feel like in the classroom, maybe. <laughs> and I'm using two computers, as you can see, one with the slides and one with my script, to not confuse our translators, our great interpreters in the back, so, and to stick to the time schedule. <laughs> so first of all, OK, um, a little bit about myself. right? Um, so. There was this great introduction of myself. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and we're going to see the topics that I will cover here today. Um, as I made, it's always for me amazing to witness the positive impact that um, all this communication, inter inclusive or intercultural communication, has on individuals and organizations. Um, so on a small scale or on a larger scale, and how it really helps breaking down the barriers and um, fostering awareness. And awareness is really my keyword always when I speak to people about this topic. Um, and also then to come to at least some more understanding um, among the diverse groups. Now working in Japan, again, with some Japanese-only groups or um, Japanese-only classes, which are diverse too. And then the more, well, visually more diverse international classes, um, with various age groups and genders. Um, it's always fascinating in, in the end to see um, that the people really show similar worries, similar fears and scares when working with strange or other environments or cultures or people. Um, anything that's unfamiliar really to them. So in the end really, um, it's just important of trying to understand each other. 
And that's, it sounds so simple, and yet it's so difficult. So today, again, I want to go through these um, various aspects and hope that we will leave this room with a little bit more awareness. And it might be helpful for the next sessions that are coming up as well. So there was this nice introduction of myself. Uh, so thank you again for the one part introduction of me. Um, so I'm Nato Economy, professor and manager at the Global Strategies Office and vice president for international affairs and diversity at Kyushu University. And I've lived and worked and studied, well, worked mostly in higher education um, in Japan for 26 years now. And as my bio tells, me, tells you, when we're looking at this nice, kind of boring points, <laughs> the slide is not very interesting, maybe. Um, I've, so basically, I hold degrees from Augsburg University in Germany. I'm originally from Germany, um, from Nago University in Japan. And my research, again, covers organizational management and strategic alliances. But mainly nowadays, I totally shifted into intercultural communication. Um, my experience is, again, in ed education, intercultural communication. It includes, as introduced, navigating the diverse classrooms and helping, well, survive in diverse environments, um, mainly in Japan, as I mentioned. Um, so, again, it's really for classrooms Japanese enterprises of all sizes that I um, provided training sessions, um, also local communities, and um, recently also for, we have a lot of university networks with other countries. And we noticed that we never have any intercultural or intercommuni like communication sessions really in them. So I also offer training sessions before the com um, symposia start, for example. So, um, the main reason for me to do this is really, especially for in Japan, again, foster intercultural awareness. And I keep repeating awareness, awareness, because I think it's the most important aspect here. Um, now with this, you probably have a certain impression of me. I'm talking here, using my hands, all <laughs> wiggly. And um, what kind of impression do you have of me now? With this information and me talking here and what President Marquitas provided, I'm sure you have your first impression of me. Let me show another slide. This is me, when I was really cute. <laughs> right. um, I was born actually in Scotland. So this is a map for those who don't know where Scotland is, <laughs> but I'm sure we're all okay. Um, as I said earlier though, um, and German. I moved to Germany when I was six years old, actually, for the first time, so to say. Um, before that, I lived with my parents in Canada and um, the United States. And as I said, I lived a long time now, 26 years in Japan. And in Japan, I moved to various places. I started off in Nagoya. Um, then went all, I had enough of the heat <laughs> in the summer, went up to Hokkaido, to Kitami, all the way in the north. Um, and then I came to Kyushu in 2019. In between, there were some times in Tokyo as well. And um, yes, so I lived in Japan for, I would say, one and a half years um, when I was a junior high school student. And I always wanted to live in Japan after that. It was such a great experience for me. So I came to study at Nago University. That was my dream, to study in Japan and come and stay for a year and then leave again. Um, we all know how that worked out. So 26 years here now. Um, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of international students. And I did my degree at Nago University here with some Chinese um, colleagues of me at that time. So. Wherever I lived in Japan, wherever I lived in the world, I always noticed it's different. And just the performance of our, um, on the Ryukyu, the dance, and the language shows it's different. I mean, everybody says we're in Japan, but I mean, this is Okinawa. The indigenous language is very, very different. And it's something that we always have to keep in mind. So, you know, just with this information now, I don't know, has your image changed a little bit of myself, of me. <laughs> English is not my first language, as you can notice. 
So why am I telling you all of this now? One reason is, um, again, to show you how um, the impression that you have of a person changes with the number of information you receive about that information, uh, about that person, right? So um, the second one is really to show you how my childhood, I was already raised in various, or I got the experience of various cultures. Um, of course, I was not conscious about that as a child. You just enjoy what you experience. But it taught me a lot to already adapt in certain situations. And that can be starting with nonverbal communication, right? So I want to do a little wake up, wake up, no, warm up practice with everyone um, to make sure you all stay awake <laughs> in the morning. Um, this is a possible gesture that you can see in Japan, or maybe in other countries as well. Putting your hands together in front of your face. And then sometimes in the textbooks, it, it's from a textbook actually, it says usually applied by women. What do you think could this be? Yeah, I already see like, <laughs> I see some. And maybe what does it mean in your country? Maybe I'm doing something really bad in another country with a gesture like that. But in Japan, it would be, for example, that one. I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry. Ah, go ma'am. The cute version, I guess. Or please do me a favor. Onegai, right? One example. What about this one? Waving your hand back and forth in front of your face. So what does it mean? I get the laughter. <laughs> what, what would it mean? Yeah, something stings, exactly. That's the most common version. In Japan, it can also be, chigao, no, no. No, you're wrong. No, 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 I'm not going to do this. <laughs> or it can be, no way. Right? Or it can be just, it stinks. <laughs> Another example, pointing with your in index finger towards you. And it's Japanese people are like, no, we don't use that. But then when they do have conversations, they sometimes do it. <laughs> what could this be? Uh, for those who are in Japan, you know, probably. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> Told you it's a classroom. <laughs> so it's basically me. You can do it like this. Me, other countries do it like this. Often it's like this. Just another cute one. Both hands in height of your face, palm down, palm hand pointing to the ground. Like this. <laughs> so I sometimes get like a dog or something. Um, in Japan, this can be, where, where are the Japanese? <laughs> it can be ghost, right? The symbol for ghost, for example. So just an example of gestures, right, that can have totally different meaning. And um, we all know, obviously, that there are various behaviors um, or types of behaviors that we take, um, that play, take place in different cultures and country, different settings. Um, this can be based on cultural differences, of course, but also on personal differences. What kind of gestures do we use? Um, so even within the same or similar cultural backgrounds, um, there are just different ways on how we use our body language, the space, for example, um, to connect with other people. And um, different cultures will have different notion, norms, really. And if two people, as you know, who are from different cultures or different norms come in contact with each other and then use different gestures, it can be sometimes very misleading. So already here, when we talk about communication, we also have, include, have to include things like this, the nonverbal aspect. Um, to stay warm up, warmed up, a little bit more of some questions that I have for you. Please raise your hand um, if one of the following statements now applies to you. Okay, I sometimes sing in the shower. Okay, or in the bathtub <laughs> for the ofudo. They were quite a lot, very nice. I've spent more than one month in the country other than my birthplace. Okay, I guess that goes for everyone here in this room. <laughs> or maybe not necessarily. 
See, I'm already making here some assumptions. I don't know. Maybe some of the oysters here have been here, here in Oist, or <laughs> not Oist, but Naha or Okinawa, right? Um, what about this one? I can speak a second language. Okay. Also everyone, very nice, good. <laughs> Sometimes I get very different answers to this one, right? Depending on the classroom that I'm teaching. Um, and then, how about this one? I made a mistake when dealing with another culture. I think we've always, all, everybody has been through that, right? It's nice to see though that you're raising your hand, you're like, I'm aware I made a mistake, <laughs> right? That's where it starts already. And um, how about this one? I've been irritated by people's different working styles and perspectives. This is where inclusive communication comes in, right? <laughs> so I just think such small, simple warm, like warm up or task can really help create, again, awareness. Already when we start, it's, it helps us to think about the communication aspect. Um, and most importantly, in a fun and simple way. So, I'd like to use, with, with such simple activities, um, I do use those always in my classrooms for any activities, just again to create awareness. Um, now you might have noticed that um, I often talk about intercultural communication or intercultural communication, um, which is my main field, as I mentioned. Um, however, sometimes I also use the word inclusive communication. And I use it in a similar context. Um, why do I do that? Why is that? Um, so to me, inclusive communication involves, of course, the strategies and language um, choices. It, it ensures everyone in the conversation feels respected, um, valued, of course, and understood, um, no, no matter really the backgrounds or identities. Now, it aims to remove the barriers um, which could exclude people from different groups. Now, intercultural communication on the other hand, um, focuses specifically really on the um, interactive, interactivities between the people from different cultures. And it emphasizes understanding the values again and the norms and the practices that shape how we communicate in diverse cultural contexts. This understanding again is really what enables um, the effective and respectful exchanges across cultural lines. Now both inclusive and intercultural communication at the end, they center on respecting and understanding diversity, I think. So inclusive communication has a wider scope, I would say. Um, but it encom encompasses not only cultural, but also all other types of diversity. But in the end, both aim to bridge the differences and um, sort of, well, between different worlds. That can be my own personal little world that I have or the common stereotype worlds that we have. Um, whether culture or in any other type. And it's, they start with how we perceive the things differently in the end. So again, awareness and understanding are the key points. And the approach to reaching that are similar, I believe, in inclusive and intercultural communication. So a little question here. Do you recognize any of these words? And if so, what is like the equivalent word in English or Japanese or your mother tongue? Because I'm sure everybody's from a different country here. <laughs> it's very international. So we have, for example, and my pronunciation might be wrong. Sobremesa. <laughs> Hüge. Right? Apricity. Ma. And Schlotreya. So do you recognize any of these words? Some yes, so did some yes. So that was wrong pronunciation, right? <laughs> yeah, let's take a look at Sopramesa, maybe. Right? It's Spanish. And it's that it describes the time we spend after a meal with friends or family, just chatting and laughing and speaking before we even clean the table or leave the table. Right? So it's this whole atmosphere, this whole culture expressed in one word. Do you have a similar word in your language? I cannot come up any, with anything in German language or even in Japanese. So, one interesting example. Another one, as I mentioned, is the Hige. Has anyone heard? I'm sure, Karen, you have, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so we have. Yeah, exactly. So, Hige is 
Danish. Um, it can be used as a noun or as an adjective as well. And um, yeah, in the dictionaries, it's kind of defined as a cozy quality that makes a person feel content and comfortable, or invoking or fostering a sense of coziness, contentment, and well-being. Um, but when you look at all the different meanings it, it has now used in the language, and not only in Denmark, um, it's really like live the hig away or simply have, like simply have a beer with a friend or without friends, just by yourself can be hig. Um, you have the most hig bicycle even. Um, or just like the part, the taste of your childhood can be hig. Right? So, and I, again, I don't know, can you think of a word in your language that kind of represents this feeling. And the other word was, again, apricity. Apricity? Apricity, yeah. Bad in pronunciation. But this is, all our English speakers should know. <laughs> it's actually English, and it's the warmth of the sun on a winter's day. So it's kind of a winter word, right? But not necessarily used in Okinawa, maybe. <laughs> I don't know how cold it gets. <laughs> Or the word ma, right? This is a Japanese word, and I'm actually gonna talk about that later, so I'm not gonna ask you here what you think it is, but just think of a, what it could be for the Japanese as well. Think of, oh, what could, how could we explain ma in English, <laughs> right? I'll share my thoughts about that later. What about this one? Schlotreyer. Anyone? Okay. So actually, this is a word that a colleague and I were bored and we were just making up a word. <laughs> so it's basically 13 characters in search of a meaning. We can define it as we like. If we use it a lot in the world, using online nowadays, we might be able to spread it. It might end up in the dictionaries. <laughs> so we can give definitions to a word based maybe on our culture or our backgrounds. So just something to keep in mind. Another example um, can be how you name colors. For example, in this image, um, which is not showing up. So what do you name the colors in this image? Right. So we have red probably in many countries. In Japanese, we say aka, the traffic lights. Now here it already becomes tricky. My UK colleagues say amber. In Germany, you might say orange or yellow even for it. In Japanese, it's kido, so I'd say ten, tendency is more yellow. Green, green light. In Japanese, we use ao, which actually would be, if we translate it nowadays, blue. In Japanese, we have ao ringo, blue apples. Aoba, the green, green vegetable, sofa plant. <laughs> what about? We call these birds in German Rotkehlchen, so we use red. The hair color. What, what color, what language do you use to describe this color, right? What word? And in Japanese language, um, so there's also separate terms for blue and green. As I said, ao is blue nowadays, and green is midori. Um, but the word ao was used in old Japanese for green and blue. So we have a a kind of culture mix now from past, how the words were defined in the past and nowadays, and some of the older terminology sticks to certain objects still, for example. So different words, different worlds. So something that I want everyone, again, to think about. Now, um, this is just one example of how our language and our culture really influences how we perceive the ways by ourselves. Now, as people, we perceive the world in particular ways, um, according to really how we have become socialized to do so, right? But also what experience we've had. And we each act in accordance with the perception that we have. So when we look at the, for example, I like to use this Shibuya um, scramble crossing. It's very famous in the world. Um, one person here might see chaos. Another person might say, oh, it's really order, orderly, like they, they're not bumping into each other, <laughs> right? The same goes for justice and fairness. One person might perceive something as just, as fair, while another 
perceives as unequal, right, or institutional discrimination. Any kind of soin, sound, for one person this might be music, for another that might be noise. And the color was just another example, the blue and green, right? So personal perception is what, again, influences then our way of communicating. And we have to be aware of that. So yeah, these are our personal normalities. So what we think is maybe the correct way or the normal way. And some aspects, again, as I mentioned that earlier, we, sh we share with others, but some we might not share with the others. And it's really influenced by so many factors, right? For example, and I hope this shows up here. Someone might have grown up in Holland and then a person in Hawaii changes everything. <laughs> I might have grown up in the city, another person in the countryside, right? Or I might have grown up in the 1980s and you in the 2000s, 20s. Yes, so gender, gender gaps, another issue. But in the end, um, Yes, so in the end, it's all our personal perception, and we need to be aware that they are different, right? So what happens when you come into one another's world, right? I would say usually um, we each act in the scene um, according to what we believe are the rules for this, right? We may read the actions of others um, from our own viewpoint, right? And we may assume that others read our actions from our viewpoint too. Now, in the end, we always seek out ways to interpret conduct um, that does not match what we would um, expect to be according to our rules, right? So again, we have to be aware of this in any social setting, um, be it in the classroom, in a business meeting, or simply really dealing with or having any encounter with a person we haven't met before maybe, right? So again, it's all about awareness. So I want you to imagine another setting. Okay, Dell, Dell update, but not right. <laughs> So imagine a scenario in an international company, they are holding a meeting in Thailand. Um, I actually joined a meeting like that, and I had the chance to talk to the participants there. Um, so we had Thai, US, French participants. It was about mainly US participants and Thai, and then we had a few French and one Japanese colleague joined. And the meeting was held in English. And it's dominated by the English-speaking uh, well, the US speakers, to be honest, um, with Thai and French and Japanese, well, they spoke a little, right? And my question is, have you experienced meetings like this? Probably a lot of people who work in an international setting. So what's going on here? Um, now, when asking the participants, again, so from now being West European, sort of, <laughs> from West European world view or perspective, um, and here we're talking stereotypes. Again, very important. The US, the US colleagues presumably use English as a first and main language, and therefore they are more confident. That's what most people would answer, or do answer often when we ask them. The other nationalities might feel more insecure about their English, so the French, Thai, and Japanese. And therefore the Americans will basically dominate and probably drive maybe even the decision-making of the meeting, right? So they're more confident and the other countries are maybe a little bit more insecure about their language and reluctant to participate or lose face even. And you might notice I keep using gestures that might not necessarily be understood by every, every person, but I do assume, going assuming, some assuming that everybody gets this, <laughs> right? They tend to use, but in Japan it's not used that much actually. So again, when I talk about awareness, I'm aware, but I always use it anyway. <laughs> right. Um, so keeping this meeting scenario in mind, um, 
I have a question for you now again. Just this slide a bit slower. What's happening here? Okay. What do you see here? Yeah, a bouquet of flowers. Okay. And here? Basically, it's flower arrangements, right? Um, sort of the Western style with the Japanese style. Two different styles, Ikebana style, right? Um, so when we look at this, do you notice something, the difference? <laughs> First of all, um, the Western style arrangement really fills out the whole space. Right? And it's full. Whereas the Japanese arrangement is more open and um, uses spaces. And these spaces in Japanese are called, what I mentioned earlier, the word ma. Okay. Um, now, to all the people in the room who do speak Japanese, how would you define ma? How would you explain a foreigner the word ma? Or a foreigner or a person who doesn't speak Japanese. Right? So, ma is a very interesting word. Um, when you look it up in the dictionary, it basically covers like time, interval, or space, or um, the kanji. The Chinese character is made from gate and sun, actually, and combined, it's ma. Does it show up? Yes. Um, but it can also be sorry, that's what happens when you use animation. <laughs> so, but it can also be something like um, anything that's left unsaid, um, space, emptiness, omission. But it can also be like the space that allows for reflection and quiet, right? Um, it can be the the pause the space between notes of music. It can also be like the shape of space between, between walls. You have ma, right? So it has many, many different meanings. And um, yeah, so now it comes up the animation. So in the flower arrangement, this is exactly what you see. You have the one tendency to fill space and the other tendency to kind of leave space, the ma. Right? And in, in the culture, that's also the same. And it's important for knowing when you have communication in Japanese on an intercultural level. Right? Um, so for example, it's also interesting how you can use the ma, the word ma, in combination with other Japanese or Chinese characters. For example, a human being is ningen, the person, and ma combined, ningen, human being. There's also the nice word, ma nuke. Ma nuke without. It can mean idiot or stupid if we translate it into English. <laughs> it wouldn't be that direct necessary in Japanese. Um, but with these words, they describe sort of already a way of thinking how people perceive something in Jap Japanese culture, maybe, that is not visual really to, in the language to other people who learn the, uh, the language. So now take a moment again to imagine the scene again in the meeting, right? So what, might the, what could the US colleagues think about their participation themselves? So they will, might be, okay, we're confident, um, creative, dominant, leading, wonderful. Um, but from a Japanese colleague's perspective, what do they think maybe about the US colleagues in that situation? Well, okay, they seem really pompous, you know, they don't have the ma, <laughs> maybe. Um, and I asked the Japanese participant actually about that, and I, this was like an answer I got from them. And they were like, yeah, but I think it's because the Americans, from a Japanese perspective, um, they, the jo they don't have a job security in the S, so they have to make themselves more loud, they have to be more confident to make sure they don't get fired. Stereotype, right? Based on an image, a perception that they have of another country. Um, right? They always have to compete with each other. So um, this kind of situation 
can actually lead to really unwanted development. For example, what happened actually at that meeting was, and I'm lucky because I speak Japanese, so they kind of included me in that part as well, is they, the Thai, French, and Japanese later met again in a different setting and discussed again about the contents. So in the end, they might kind of exclude the US colleagues again from the decision making just based on this kind of bias and stereotyping in that sense. So they would, for example, yeah, meet away from, away from the US colleagues afterwards to have some time to talk with each other because they didn't have enough time to express their opinions. So they're creating barriers, these stereotypes, these biases that we have in meetings and settings like this as well. So um, how can we break down these barriers, right? And acknowledge the biases when we work with cultural and other stereotypes and differences. Um, so common communication barriers are, as I mentioned, language, cultural norms, um, accessibility, which can hinder our ability to really connect. Now recognizing, again, being aware of these barriers is the first step toward inclusivity. And again, I keep saying that again and again because I think awareness is the key. And with that awareness comes the next step of having to at least try um, to overcome personal biases. And we all have biases. So even through my work and experience in diverse settings, I've learned that um, how important it is to continuously um, self-reflect and stay open. Because I also have biases and I have to remember and re again and again make myself aware and act accordingly. Um, so yeah, self-reflect a moment. What kind of biases do you have? And do you sometimes act on those still? Now, when we work um, with cultural and other stereotypes, the more we have experienced, and I think everybody here probably has experienced a lot of intercultural settings, the more we kind of come to expect um, to encounter and navigate like different normalities, right? And so we are aware that working with other involves taking time to explore how much overlap and difference there is between the members. So always something to keep in mind. Now, when we talk, again, about stereotypes, so the set of ideas that people have about what someone or something is like, especially an idea that is wrong, usually, um, there are more immediate accessible markers. So again, what we have nowadays, a lot of gender, ethnicity, ethnicity and age. Um, we might analyze a person's dialect or dress, and we make assumptions on their like, socioeconomic background, of course, nationality, their sexuality, or educational backgrounds. And there's a greater interactional space involved in asserting other aspects, such as forms of address, um, institutional roles, or geographic origin, language identity, and any shared history as well. So kind of teasing out the intercultural dimension is really, how do I read you, and how are you reading me? And when we look at the meeting scenario again, right, um, some of these stereotypes may have already existed for the individual as individual ideas about one another before the meeting. Um, but in developing a collaboration, and members need to move these ideas really into the public sphere then, um, where they can be acknowledged and modified as a basis of shared knowledge between the respective parties and the groundwork for shared social engagement. So, and that brings me to another very quick example of the COVID-19. We all remember that, right? It's not over yet, really, really. So. But in 2022, the UK government dropped the recommendation to wear masks and is now um, it's leaving it up to the individual to decide whether to wear a mask or not, right? Now, this is a photo taken in the UK. When do you think it was taken? Right, probably during the pandemic, so before 2022. And um, yeah, why do you think the people are wearing masks? Right, so usually, I got, I got something in the back just now, so, but why are they wearing masks? Maybe COVID protect, protection, or another person might think, oh, I want to protect the others. It's the rules, right? I don't want to get into trouble with the peers around. Now, in Japan, the government dropped the recommendation to wear masks in March 2023, right? 
And I'm showing you a picture now again. So where might this photo have been taken? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, everybody here traveling into Japan even probably noticed. This could have been taken any time. Um, why do you think they're wearing masks? Right? Again, there are many, many reasons nowadays, or in Japan. It makes me look more attractive. I don't want others to feel uncomfortable. I have a cold. I didn't feel like shaving today. I'm not used to sh uh, showing my face anymore. The pandemic has strongly influenced me. It's fashion nowadays. It makes me anonymous. Oh, it's allergy season, right? So there are many, many reasons why people are wearing masks in Japan today. And at my university, and I do think in, my, in many places in Japan, um, also the government is kind of calling for it, but um, we are constantly reminded not to judge people based on if they are wearing a mask or not. Um, so it's up to you, and there should be no discrimination <laughs> based on wearing a mask even. Um, because I, 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 just went to, I just came back from Australia, actually, with a mask. Um, I started wearing a mask coming from Japan, people would stare at me because no one wears masks there, so I felt this peer pressure of taking it off. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I come down with the flu again. <laughs> so to really enhance um, individuals or groups' abilities and confidence or authority by using approaches that are, that are inclusive, we need to explore different ways of interacting. Um, and this mask was just an example for that situation. So practical strategies um, for inclusion from my experience in my class and workshops on intercultural communication are really to encourage participation, um, to use inclusive language, which is, again, then different um, depending on the language you use in that classroom, right? Um, and it, at least try to understand that cultural nuances um, can significantly enhance our interactions. So again, it's being aware of it. And the goal of these kind of strategies is to create environments where everyone has the opportunity to contribute and thrive, and leading to better outcomes for individuals and the group as a whole. And um, so I keep saying awareness, awareness, awareness. So starting with awareness as an individual, what can you do to really contribute to your own and other intercultural communication? And I always list these 10 points. They're textbook points, I think. Right? Try to understand each other's way of thinking. Don't be caught only in your own cultural way of looking at things. Be open-minded. Um, develop the ability to withhold your judgment sometimes. And develop the ability to even control your emotions sometimes. Right? The other five points would be um, have a flexible mind, sympathy for the other person. Try to become a good listener have a feeling of enjoying differences, and learn to develop a certain flexibility to be able to laugh at your own mistakes as well, right? Um, all these points sound really easy, but we all know in reality they're not. It's really, really difficult to keep those in mind and try to follow them. And that's the part where everybody kind of has to self-reflect and keep in mind to try to look at things from a new angle, right? And I know this is very basic, but I do think that every time it's really important to remind people of that. And in the classroom, um, when I do activities, I always start with activities like this, self-reflection activities before any discussion. So it's like I might start with a question like, okay, you've traveled, remember a time when you traveled somewhere, what made you feel insecure? What made you feel comfortable? It can be things like that. Um, of course, it's always very good to have group activities that raise awareness and build trust within the group in the classroom in a setting to communicate with each other. Because if there is no trust, if you don't start to build that trust, you will never cross a certain level of communication with that other person. So I do include a lot of different training exercises, um, which I'm not going to do with you today. <laughs> but actually, I'm going to do one with you. One plus three, four, we can do that, right? Four plus three, seven. Five plus 10, three. Four plus nine, one. Six plus eight, two. Nine plus seven, four. Seven plus 10, five. Three plus nine, 12. 10 plus five, three. 
Two plus one. Three. All happy? Did anyone get confused? <laughs> Anything wrong here? <laughs> so, and usually that's what I not do in the classroom. I don't rush through it and then go, okay, that's it. Because that would leave my students very confused and explain exactly what's going on. Um, but it's basically the idea of having a 10 numerical versus the 12 numerical counting, right? We all usually in the classrooms maybe use 5 plus 10 is 15. But when you look at the clock, at the watch, 15 is 3. So using the 3 would not be wrong, according to certain other rules. Right? Does that make sense? Because I don't want to leave you all confused. <laughs> Um, when I have sessions with um, companies, I often, at the beginning, ask, okay, what can the company do on an organizational level um, to promote inclusive communication amongst its employees? And they're usually the common four points that you get are these, right? So provide training for staff um, on diversity communication, create opportunities for positive um, exposure, so all these points are things that I think everybody's already trying to do. And I think even that, like, especially at OIST as well, C-Hub is doing a lot of effort in this as well. So these are things that I just want everybody to be aware of when we, do, when we talk about inclusive or intercultural communication, in my case. So with this, I hope I was able to kind of chaotically <laughs> navigate you through some of the basics of the rich landscape that we have um, on, on inclusive communication and maybe help you understand. But I, this is a very international group already, and I really know that you probably have all the basics. Um, but you will help contribute to global harmony. And it sounds huge, but I think it's really what is, that's what inclusive communication is about. And um, I hope that you will all leave this session a little bit with heightened awareness that I keep reminding people about, um, of the importance of the role of inclusive communication. And also to be aware that in whatever setting you are, you can always provide a space for inclusive or intercultural communication and tear down the barriers. So each one of us can really contribute. It's not we might or we have to, but we can, all can, we can really do it. So that's the point of how to build bridges between different cultures or settings. And with that, I hope this was a little bit of an interesting <laughs> for you, and um, I'll come to an end, and happy for any questions or thoughts. Thank you. I was, uh, what I wanted to, to ask you about is, with your sort of list of points at the end, um, about the, the desirable qualities, about having a flexible mind and, and so on, is that these are kind of quite tough things to do. Um, and if you had any um, recommendations or things that you use in your work, um, that you could point people to things that you can read, things that you can watch, to help you um, enrich your understanding, Just some tools to how to do this. Because sure, you can have you can have training, maybe I don't know once a term or whatever. But this is really, I think, that later on, or, or one of these, you said the key thing is that, or I think, the really important is the self awareness, yes. um, and how many quick prejudgments you make all the time. Anyhow, so to get to the to the question is, what, what would you recommend about somebody who wanted to develop this more in themselves? Any favorite materials that you recommend or any favorite sort of processes that you'd recommend? So I do have a number of favorite books. I can share the list <laughs> with everyone later. Um, also, I do tell the students, take a look at YouTube videos even. And I give them some interesting links. And for example, during the pandemic, um, the big coil, boom came, I would say, with the um, collaborative online international learning classes. And I had a lot, a lot of sessions on how to provide COIL, meaning training sessions for myself, how to do it online. And most of these sessions were hosted by American counterparts. So for example, um, New York um, SUNY, S-U-N-Y, <laughs> who kind of developed COIL first, right? And um, what was really interesting for me is like we joined these sessions all the Japanese universities gathered at a forum 
and they provided the session. And we were all sitting there and we're like, great ideas, great videos that they provided, um, but we might not be able to use them in the Japanese classroom necessary. It was a very American way of dealing with the issues. So depending on the groups that you're dealing with or working with, my material choices change again. So I might use, for Japanese, there are some videos or nice stories about how like a half Japanese person um, or child kind of lives or experiences the school life. And to show a video of how they experience it and make Japanese students, for example, aware of how they kind of already discriminate in some situations, um, that person. So it really, again, I use a lot of YouTube, to be honest, um, because there is great, great material out there. But depending on the classroom, you really have to make your choice, which, which is the target group, and look at the cultural backgrounds as well. So, but I'm happy to share some sources that I like to use. Thank you. Uh, very interesting, and I think we all are took a lot of things with us from this uh, expose. <laughs> but one thing that I was wondering about is uh, this word "ma" that you said you talked about because you you said that it uh, really kind of shows the open space in this culture. Uh, but you relate when you relate it to it, a different, uh, you know, how it really what it what it contains, it was uh, a lot of uh, a lot of reflection and things like that. So, but I was wondering, do you think that this culture then that has that ma awareness also are more, uh, can understand, are more aware of the possibilities for, you know, exploration in that space? Because if you, if you have a culture where everything is filled and it's not so much, uh, you know, to thinking about what curiosity can take us in the next phase, the transformation the world needs and everything. Do you think that there could be actually a better situation here in this culture that could understand that there's a lot in that empty space? I'd like to think that. <laughs> um, because, yes, I do think that, I do think it can help maybe to, for them, for, for them, I'm saying for anyone who has this thinking of ma, um, to be more observant of a situation and maybe, maybe a little bit more open and flexible, but that's like an ideal way of looking at it. Sometimes you have this ma and you kind of but interpret all the, everything that goes in there based on your own, own your normalities, right? So if you don't follow that ma or if you talk too much, Again, the Japanese would say, you talk too much, um, so you must be insecure, or it's just, you might define or misunderstand the situation. And at the same time, what you have in Japan is, um, or in, Jap in that culture, I believe is that not everybody has the same definition of this ma. So this already leads again to misunderstandings. And, um, it, the problem with ma is that you have these unspoken rules that you kind of are supposed to know about because you were set, grew up in this situation with this background in a certain environment. And that can again lead to some difficulty because you are not used to actually talking about that situation. So the communication part maybe is less trained or less evolved, maybe one way to put it. So it's, it's kind of both. You can have them be more observant and that leaving more space to be more flexible or able to understand, but it can also go into the other direction. So I wouldn't say it's a better way necessarily. <laughs> like a nice in-between would be great. <laughs> a balanced approach, yeah. Um, thank you very much for your really great talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the meeting situation where you had the, so for example, you had the 20% Americans um, and someone has mentioned about like self-awareness, uh, we mentioned about self-awareness, but um, what advice do you have when, you know, so I'm a native speaker and maybe I'm very self-aware and want other people to speak, but there might be two other native speakers who are just going for it, they're like speaking really fast, and I've tried doing things like being like, 
oh, so what do you think, Japanese person? And then they're like, wait, why, why are you putting me on the spot? Don't do, don't do that. And, and so they get more alienated. And so, like, what, what can you do as kind of an ally kind of situation? Like, I want to help, but, like, I, I don't know what to do in that situation. Right, right. It's, you know, you, can, you don't want to create this, for them, maybe a, the place where they lose face or put them in a weird situation, awkward situation. So sometimes you just have to go with the flow. <laughs> And um, after the meeting, for example, try to set up like a different space where they can all meet together, maybe drinking. I think out of the meeting rooms is a better placement sometimes for them to communicate. Once there is some alcohol, for example, in that, in that case, um, we did have a number of meetings afterwards, like the dinner party. And then suddenly, with a little bit of alcohol, <laughs> the communication went better. But like if it's a place like that, um, in a classroom, I can use a talking stick, for example. I don't know if you know about that, but you can just decide from the beginning. Everybody's getting a talking stick. Everybody can speak who has a talking stick. You're not supposed to interrupt. But the person, everybody has to take the talking stick once to share their ideas. In a regular meeting, you don't really do that. So usually, in that situation, I, I would have been in the same situation. I'm like, OK, how do I do that? How do I put them not on the spot? Um, I did not lead that meeting. And in other scenarios, I kind of translate. So I sit, usually I sit like close to the Japanese and I kind of explain something. And then I kind of try to pull them in as an observer from the back and share their ideas. And I might share those then as a translator, actually. So there are different approaches. But I, it is actually the big question of how can you do that without um, yeah, making them feel uncomfortable. And again, it depends on the person, on each individual, right? So some might be might cooler about it, others be more scared about the whole situation. So I don't really have the perfect answer for that. <laughs> Hiya. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just reflecting on the same situation, but sort of thinking of it more in terms of as scientists, because as scientists we meet together, uh, you know, as scientists... Science is a global sport. We meet together at conferences and it's always an international group. And I just think, for me, um, if I'm thinking back to my early career, where as a woman I was a minority, then I think um, that it wasn't so much, you know, the English speakers. It was more a case that the men had the voice and were competitive and the result of that I think was that women female scientists actually they became more collaborative and they sort of joined forces and they joined forces in you know not only their science but also in sort of addressing the gender issues so you know it, it yeah yeah it can move on absolutely because I I mean, the examples I gave, they were very, they, they didn't focus on the aspect of gender, for example, or it was just like the overall picture. And um, like, for example, myself, I'm, wor I'm working as a vice president in a Japanese national university, and I'm a foreigner, I'm a woman. There are not many females or foreigners in positions like that at many universities in Japan, I think. Um, so the way, as a woman, I sit in some of the meetings is in Japan different than how I sit in another meeting at an international conference. Um, so I kind of try to read the atmosphere. It's male-based, but I still want to make comments, so I have to kind of adapt and see how I can, you know, depending on the age, age range of the leadership as well, it differs on, in that sense as well. So the gender aspect as a, as a woman, the, the whole thing becomes even more comp <laughs> or thing I'd say the whole situation becomes sometimes a little bit more complicated and see how to include in yeah build this inclusive communication in that area as well so an important comment hi thank you <laughs> um, oh. I I actually have an example that just happened <laughs> applause <laughs> Um, when I came here, I had to kind of relearn because in Austria at the university we knock, <laughs> um, and then also I was mostly a musician for some time, and there was are some 
um, musicians who prefer their audience to hum mm -hmm. at the end instead of clapping or something like that. And I've kind of reflected now, and for me, it's the humming is like appreciation. The knocking is more like, ah, thanks, colleague. Um, let's talk about this afterwards. It's more like this. And the applause for me actually makes it more difficult to ask a question okay. or approach the speaker because I feel like it's a very formal thing. And it's just the way we do applause. And this again is very interesting because it's also a generation thing, I think. Because um, in Germany, when I was in university a long, long time ago, um, we applause still. And then I came to Germany to give a talk, actually, in a in classroom. Um, I haven't been for, in a German classroom in a while. And then after my talk, they did the knocking. And I got so scared. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> um, so yeah, with the, so the, they were all like, no, we always do that. I was like, no, 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 you didn't do that like <laughs> years ago. <laughs> so it's also how it evolves and how it can bring in really weird situations. And that brings me actually to one, one funny experience that and it's actually not funny because um, we're taking a group photo at an orientation session for our international students. And we took the photo, about 60 students, I think, over there. And the, photograph, the, the cameraman is looking at the picture, and I was like, okay, just wait a second, everyone. We just want to see that no one shut their eyes, you know, blinked. And one student suddenly said, that was something really racist to say. And I was like, oh my God, like I'm, like seriously, I, I, th I think of myself of, hopefully not racist. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, well, we Asians have very small eyes, and if you say you're looking, you know, if they <laughs> check if, I, if the eyes are open, that's, I feel very insulted. And I was like, oh, ooh, okay, now we, I really have to be careful with the language, even in that scenario, because I thought he was joking at first. I was like, oh, you're joking, right? It's like everybody closes their eyes <laughs> sometimes on the picture. Um, but he was really serious about it, and. He, he said, I really hurt his feelings. So it's just like, um, I don't know, some generations might be a little bit more sensitive on that as well. And while, okay, now I come to the stereotype of Generation X and Z and blah, blah. <laughs> but um, this was another interesting experience to me, actually. So how it evolves in time, gestures, the way we talk, the language itself, and how we have to adapt even in that sense. So that what, I think that's what makes inclusive or intercultural communication even more difficult. And we have to keep that in mind as well. So yeah, very nice example. I hate to cut this uh, wonderful <laughs> discussion off. Thank you so much, but we, I need to make sure that people, like my, oh, my team is giving me the... So. Should we applaud or should we not? Oh, okay, go for the knock. I'm trying to hold it in. <laughs> like, go out, go out. <laughs> oh yeah, so other people do this, right? <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah.